So warm welcome, uh, Olaf Scholz. Great to have you here um, at um, our roundtable. Uh, we have about 1,000 senior managers joining from Europe uh, that conference. Um, and of course, um, we would love to discuss what the political <coughs> um, answer is going forward uh, to the challenges um, in the crisis. Um, <clears throat> we are, of course, facing an unprecedented crisis, and we had a, a discussion already um, this morning um, walking through the different um, elements of that. Um, I think we all agree it's affecting the real economy, it's affecting many uh, countries, basically all regions worldwide, um, and all ge geographies. And the question, of course, in Europe is, how could we emerge stronger from the crisis than we went into? And uh, so <clears throat> my first uh, question to you is, how actually did it feel to be challenged with that crisis and to put in the measures uh, you did? Um, are they working? And um, going forward, um, what else needs to be done to actually emerge stronger from that crisis than we went into? Thank you. It's absolutely fair to say that no one in Germany, in Europe, or in the world expected the crisis to come. And uh, since this is the reality that we have to defend the health of our people and uh, the health of our economy in a way, it is absolutely necessary, it was absolutely necessary that we react, we react very soon and, and do all the necessary things to, to get through this crisis. The first was that we took a lot of measures to save the people. And this is uh, what is uh, in a way called the lockdown, uh, which in Germany was not really a lockdown because the industrial production was never, never ceased and we just uh, reduced public activities in shops, in, 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 in concerts, in, in, in places and things like that, but we did never uh, stop production. But in the end, the impact on the economy was great, as it was the same in all the other countries. So the first thing we did was to take a decision in stabilizing the economy with uh, a strong package, which is uh, in, about which made it necessary to decide on an extra budget for the federal, uh, for for our, for, for for the things we can do as a state. We stabilized companies. We enlarged short-term allowance schemes and things like that. And we made it feasible that anyone has a chance to survive. This was the first reaction. And the second was that we started right after the lockdown ended with a recovery program in Germany. It was a strong decision. It came very soon. No one expected it at this moment. And it was a strong answer to the crisis. I think this helped us and it helped also Europe at all because the German economy has a size which is important for the rest of Europe. So if we make it through the crisis and we, if we help our companies to, to be successful and to recover, this will have also the same effect in the European economy. But we ended not there. We decided to do something for Europe. And there were two steps that were important for us. The first was the decision of the finance ministers to support our economies with the European program for small and medium-sized companies, uh, a lending program from the EIB, which is now working, and the same with a decision on a program which made it possible in any country to use short-term allowance schemes as we have it with the Kurzarbeit in Germany. Uh, I think shortly we got the message that it's now more than 80 billion euros that are used for short-term allowance schemes in other countries. And this is a big success because it's uh, a message of cohesion in a crisis, but it's also saying that we try to f get through this crisis together. And uh, it was then also uh, an instrument of using the European stability mechanism and making it, uh, uh, giving an access during the crisis for states who need the support of the ESM. This only helped a lot because the message to the markets was that we will be able to defend ourselves during the crisis. And so far, no state in, in Europe is, uh, has any difficulty to finance the activities they have to do. And this is a good message. It is completely different to what we learned from the debt crisis uh, 10 years ago in Europe. And it, it is the reaction to a common answer of Europe. 
And part of this decision was already that we said we will have also a recovery program in Europe, and now we have the proposal from the Council on this question with the 750 billion program, and within this, uh, 390 billion, which are about grants to member states. And this is right to do so, because if we look at the different um, situation of the member states, we see that some of them are relatively stable. You know that uh, the debt to GDP ratio in Germany is under 60% or has been under 60% in the end of the last year, but some other countries start with over 100%. And if we are acting together, it's necessary that we find a way to decrease the problems that might come for member states. And having this decision with this 300 90 billion of grants within this uh, European recovery program is, I think, the right signal to the markets and also to the future of Europe. I think there are three decisions linked to that which are very important. The first is there should be a strong program right in the beginning. And um, this is used for the next years, 21, 22, 23. And that it is not used for just for budget financing but for recovery, which is important to my, as I see it. The second is that we said it will be paid back. And we start within the next um, multi-annual financial framework of seven years with paying back, knowing that it will take some decades for doing so and paying back all the debts that are taken by the European Union. But the new debt of the European Union and the new decision to pay it back is something that changes the whole scenario of the European fiscal capacities. And this is even more so if we understand that there is the third aspect within these uh, decisions, and this is that we say there should be European own resources to finance the debt of the European Union. And this decision on the European own resources that will have to be taken in the next year, more or less, is a good message for the future. And this is what I call the Hamiltonian moment in the European Union, because having a fiscal capacity aside of the possibilities of the central bank is, I think, the necessary reform we were so desperately seeking for in the last years, and now we are doing it. Thank you very much. Um, coming from a banker's perspective, um, I would argue banks have been part of the solution so far in that crisis. But of course, if we look forward, um, one could argue the worst is still to come. So how do we prevent that a economic crisis is not becoming a banking crisis? Or in other words, the structural issues we have for a long time in Europe in the banking sector, low profitability, no consolidation, in some parts also a very high level of non-performing loans still today. These issues have been before there before the crisis, but they're also still there now. How can we actually <clears throat> ensure that the banking sector gets stronger out of that crisis <clears throat> than we went into? I think there are three or four messages which are important. The first is we did a lot after the last crisis, uh, which followed the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. If we, if we look at all the regulations that uh, took place since then, and even in the last two years, we made a lot of progress in this uh, question. We stabilized the banks much more than, uh, it, than uh, we stabilized the banks a lot. And it's really a different scenario to the situation 10, 12 years ago. And this gives us a chance that the banks will be able to deal with that crisis easier and better as they would have been able to do so if we would be in the situation of the past. The second is that uh, if we are successful in stabilizing the economy, the real economy, to say it like that, in Europe, this will have also an impact on the banking sector. Because if the companies are still working, if they have a good chance to be there after the crisis, this is also good for the banks. And the third is that we are really working very hard on the two main questions for the future, which is banking union and capital markets union. And uh, this is where we really need progress in the future. And being that much successful in 
in, in bringing further the European Union and the process of a, for a better union, I think, I think should encourage us that we continue with these efforts and that we really make it with the banking union and the capital market union as well. Understood. Um, so <clears throat> bringing one point maybe to uh, some more additional discussion, yeah, is uh, our very fragmented banking market uh, in Europe. Do you see the capital markets union and also the banking union uh, also encouraging further consolidation then in Europe, uh, bringing more scalability and also more profitability to banks, which is in the long term, of course, highly needed to be robust and resilient um, in, a, in an economy? I think the fragmentation of the banking market is not the main problem. Yes, there will be some development and we will see some consolidation. But the more important question is whether we are able to really build something which is a European market for banks and for, for the financial industry. And this is not the case today. We have uh, a lot of regulations, even regulation that should be similar in any country, but if you look at the realities, it is not really the case. And you have to go for support and uh, activities with any government in Europe. If we want to have a banking union, which is uh, also good for reducing the linkage between government debt, sovereign debt and banks. It is necessary that uh, you can put the money where you have the most effective use of it. And this is not the case today. So we have to work on something which is a banking union that really works. But we should understand that this has a lot of uh, preconditions. And my perspective in this field is that we are not staying where we stay already for years now, but that we understand that for getting a success in the banking union, we need an understanding of the end game and uh, that we have to understand what all should be changed. Opening markets is the main important question, which sometimes is forgotten. But if we do so, we need something which has to do with the rule of insolvency for banks, for instance. You cannot have different insolvency regimes for banks all over Europe if you want to have a European market. It will, be, it will not work in the end. If we will be successful, we need um, European authorities strong enough to do the supervision activities. We have this in the United States. But if we want to act together, we cannot just trust that there will be similar supervision in different countries. We need a European authority that a side of the national authorities is able to intervene if necessary. And if we won't get this, we could not develop the trust that some bank from somewhere in Europe will may, may do, might, uh, might do activities in another country with a big impact on the econo economy of this country. So it is necessary that we understand also this question. And uh, if we see this, we can also discuss on the question of, uh, of sovereign debt and banking in, 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 in the banking sector, which is important. And in the end, it is also the question of, uh, of, uh, of uh, saving uh, the uh, accounts in the end. So European deposit insurance scheme is the question which is raised there. So I think it is necessary that we have an understanding of the banking union as a scenario that combines all the different aspects and what we do not wait for starting with a solution in this field. Understood. Um, maybe one more topic to touch at. Um, we discussed extensively digitalization, of course, as uh, one uh, mega trend um, in uh, the banking industry. Yeah. Um, maybe to touch briefly on that, um, <clears throat> what's your perspective on what bankers would call, if something starts to look like a bank, it should be also regulated like a bank to create a level playing field, be it with big tech companies or um, with uh, mid-sized players that are entering that field. Can you share your perspective on that? I very much agree with this uh, request. And uh, we should understand that many of the problems that we are seeing today 
uh, have to do with the fact that there is different regulation on banks and, uh, and uh, corporates that are doing banking but are not a bank. And so it is necessary that we, that we get a more a broader view, also in questions of supervision and regulation in this field, but that we also encourage the technological progress in this field. We have to do a service for the clients of the banks and there should be faster payment structures as we have them. They should be cheaper as they are today. They should, be, they should work all over Europe. So this must be something which is very good for the customers, and may it be corporates or may it be private people. And if we understand this as a task we have, we will be able to succeed in this question. But if anyone is just sticking to what he, is, uh, what he already has, we will be not successful because there is technological progress and either we are successful in this field as well or someone else will be. So uh, if you allow, then uh, I would um, continue uh, with some more um, <coughs> uh, questions, uh, if, if that's fine for you. Uh, from a real economy perspective, entrepreneurial perspective, also banking perspective, something that is maybe a bit closer to my heart personally, um, I wonder um, <clears throat> how we can also get over the confidence crisis we have. The packages you described, the help uh, you described that the regulator, but also the government's politics provided uh, are unprecedented and seem to be effective and work. It was massive response, fast response. But also some people are wondering, of course, mm, might actually um, the initial um, caution we had to take regarding the health scenario and the health measures, um, might that be something that we have to a certain extent overcome and learned? Yeah? Uh, so in other words, um, the question is, <clears throat> could it be that we also have to get a bit out the uncertainty, the fear people have uh, regarding the future health developments? Because overcoming that fear uh, is a necessity to actually encourage uh, entrepreneurial activity personal consumption, uh, because otherwise, let's say, the measures we are taking uh, to prevent health crisis uh, could have more, could do more harm um, than actually the virus itself. Um, could you comment on that? Um, a bit broader perspective, but very close to many entrepreneurs and uh, also bankers. We have to be cautious since there is the virus and so far we have not a chance to uh, just to, just to say there is nothing like this. This is ridiculous. There is a really big threat to the people, there is a danger, and we have to deal with that situation. And as far as we have no um, therapy, as we have no vaccines, uh, we will be enforced to do something uh, that is cautious dealing with the health of our people. On the other hand, we have to learn to live with that situation. This is what I called right from the beginning a new normality, because even when we will have a vaccine, this will be effective mostly up to this midst or the end of the next year. Even if we have some sorts, parts of it for some people in the beginning of next year or in the end of this year, which is not really, it's not likely like this, but. If there, it would be very early that we have something, it will take some time before anyone gets the vaccine and could work with this. So my view is that um, we have to be cautious, we have to get along with this new normality, and then afterwards we have to, uh, to make it possible that the economy recovers, though the situation is still very difficult. And um, this is what we are seeing today. We have good uh, data from the labor market. We have good labor data from the, from from the from from the economy at all. There is uh, growth, and it looks that we will look that we will have uh, growth the next year as well. That we will come back to the strength of econ on our economy pre-crisis in the end of next year, the beginning of uh, 2022, which is relatively fast. And if we are cautious and continuously working on this growth activities, I think we will be able to, to get through this situation. Mm -hmm. 
uh, fully agree. However, we also have parts of Europe where that might take a bit longer, of course, and um, <clears throat> might be um, a substantial challenge. Um, my last question would be, um, what is your main message, uh, let's say, to the audience we have, uh, senior bankers uh, from, from Europe? Um, how could we maybe even more turn this crisis into opportunity and, and uh, get, out get out stronger than we went into on a European level? If there is a crisis, it's always a situation where you have to think about your own situation and you have to take uh, strong decisions. And it's, it's always necessary to be courageous in a way. This means that we have to do all the necessary investment in technological progress in the banking sector and the financial sector. This is absolutely key, that we trust into business models that are working for the future. And as we see, we are relatively good prepared. We have an infrastructure that can deal also with uh, video conferences and things like that. There is a lot of new investment now, but all the necessary means are there to, to do this investment and we are continuously uh, investing into the infrastructure to have more from that. And so digitalization is one of the aspects of the coming economy also in the financial sector. On the other hand, I think that uh, a lot of investment into new companies is uh, something that will work for the European economy. And one of my big wishes for the future is that there will be more equity investments in Europe as we see it so far. So especially when we think about startups, for instance, in, in Europe, and they are always linked with the idea of some technological progress and IT and things like that. But if we look at them and look at the tax regulation and look at the, uh, at the supervision and look at the authorities and, 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 we see there is not a really difference to a bit more successful places on the earth with the chances for startups to grow and to get the money for their further growth. And this is a question of mentality. So I would like to have the financial sector, or to say it like that, the financial capitalism to be a bit more successful in investment and a bit more optimistic about the future and look, not looking for others doing it themselves. I guess a capital market union will definitely help yeah, on that. So thank you very much um, for your time and sharing your insights.